A few weeks ago, on a typical Thursday morning, I found myself in the middle of our busy routine, getting our two kids ready for school. At 7.30, the chaos was briefly interrupted by the loud ringing of the phone. I became curious, wondering who could be calling at such an early hour. The caller ID showed an unfamiliar code, which piqued my interest even more. Hello? I answered cautiously, holding the phone to my ear. To my surprise, it was Claire, my wife, on the other end of the line. I couldn't help but wonder why she was calling when we had just spoken the night before. Claire works for a small marketing firm, and her call immediately grabbed my attention. I take care of our children and work from home, while she's always on the move, working at a printing company in the center of our town. Despite our different schedules, it worked well for us, and we managed to make a decent living. We live in a cozy suburban house with four bedrooms and a swimming pool, and we're fortunate to have a wide circle of friends. However, Claire told me that the previous night, when she went to the hotel lobby to get a newspaper, her purse was stolen. Please cancel our credit cards immediately and request new ones urgently. I've already informed Joy, my boss, about this, and she'll arrange for new American Express Company cards to be sent to me overnight so I can have them before I leave tomorrow. She's also going to transfer some money to help me through this, my wife said, sounding worried. You're usually very cautious with your belongings. Can you clarify what occurred? Regrettably, I was a bit absent-minded and left my purse at the cashier's counter while I went to grab some more reading material. When I returned, it was nowhere to be found. The cashier mentioned she was occupied with another customer and didn't notice anything unusual. My driver's license was in there too, but the hotel dispatched staff to check the nearby dumpsters. I hope they locate it, otherwise I might have to rely on a taxi for today's meeting. Don't worry, I'll handle the credit cards promptly. I apologize for my oversight, dear. Hopefully, apart from about $200 in my wallet, we won't face any additional expenses. We can replace the other cards gradually. Fortunately, most of my makeup is still in the room, so I'll be prepared for the morning presentation. How are the kids? I miss the times when we were all together. Let me recount what occurred around six weeks ago. Thankfully, I successfully canceled the credit cards before any unauthorized charges were made. However, the wallet containing my driver's license and other non-credit card items had yet to be recovered. So, I pushed that concern aside. Life continued as usual, but I have something important to share. Today, I came across a statement from Claire's Fidelity account, where she manages a separate investment fund from the inheritance she received after her parents' tragic accident a few years ago. I've always respected her privacy concerning this account, but while searching for our home insurance policy, I stumbled upon a folder containing monthly statements from her personal account. I recalled that the inheritance amounted to around $350,000 following her parents' passing, and I couldn't help but wonder how much it had grown. To my pleasant surprise, it had expanded to over $400,000. While going through the statement, I noticed a withdrawal of $3,000 from the money market account about six weeks ago. My curiosity was piqued regarding how she had utilized that money, so I decided to delve deeper into her money market account. To my astonishment, I discovered that she had written a substantial check to a local jewelry store just a couple of days after losing her purse in the same city. I couldn't help but wonder what she had purchased at that jewelry store. She hadn't mentioned buying anything for me, and I hadn't heard her discuss acquiring jewelry for anyone else. Although she has a brother, I couldn't comprehend why he would require a $3,000 gift. After some contemplation, I decided to turn to the computer and visit the jewelry store's website. I jotted down their phone number for further inquiry. I picked up the phone and dialed the jewelry store's number. A woman introduced herself as a store representative and inquired how she could be of assistance. After providing my name and specifying the transaction I wished to inquire about, I explained that we had encountered an issue with the purchase and were wondering if there was a store warranty in place. She proceeded to search for the transaction in her computer and then inquired about the nature of the problem with the rings. I found myself momentarily puzzled, wondering what kind of rings she could have bought. Fortunately, the woman on the phone swiftly clarified, Oh, I remember this purchase. When she visited our store, she was visibly distressed and mentioned that her wedding and engagement rings had been stolen. She wanted to replace them, which proved to be quite a challenging task. 
While we were searching for suitable options to meet her needs, she used the company's credit card as collateral and later sent us a check to cover the cost. Now that you've mentioned the issue with the rings, I'd like to assure you that our store provides a 90-day warranty for such situations. Is it possible that the diamond setting has become loose? This is perplexing, because she spoke of replacing the wedding and engagement rings, but never indicated that she had lost them, only mentioning the theft of her purse. It took me some time to process this new information. Listen, I conveyed to the woman on the phone, I need to have a discussion about this with my wife before making any further decisions. I'll get back to you later. With that, I bid her farewell. While she appeared somewhat puzzled, my own bewilderment was far more overpowering. It was becoming increasingly apparent that the rings should have been inside her purse when it was stolen. But why would she carry them in her purse if she had no intention of concealing her marital status from others? To the best of my knowledge, there were no professional constraints related to revealing one's marital status. However, if she wanted to appear unmarried in specific social circumstances, disconcerting thoughts began to circulate in my mind suggesting that she might have contemplated engaging in an extramarital affair while away from home. The mere notion of it made my stomach churn. We had been married for 11 years and were blessed with two wonderful children, Jeremy, age 7, and Melissa, age 6. I believed we had a flawless marriage and a picture-perfect family. Our personal life seemed gratifying to me, or at least that's what I had believed. She traveled once a month, staying for two or three nights in distant cities, if she harbored intentions of such actions, she might have seen it as a discreet opportunity. It seemed that losing the rings had deeply troubled her, leading her to opt for replacements that closely resembled the originals. I had purchased those rings with my modest earnings, so they were not extravagant, and crafting a near replica wasn't too costly. She could have reported the loss to the insurance company, but I probably would have found out. If her purse was genuinely stolen at the hotel, she should have reported it. I couldn't help but wonder what she claimed as missing. I decided to locate the hotel's contact number and made the call. I asked about any records related to the theft of my wife's purse. Surprisingly, they confirmed having a written account of the incident. I requested a copy to be faxed to me, and I received it shortly. The report was composed and signed by Claire herself. In the statement, Claire mentioned that her purse was stolen while she was dancing in the hall. She had left her purse at the booth where she was seated, and upon her return, it had vanished. Remarkably, Claire explicitly noted her hesitation to involve the police. As I absorbed this information, my thoughts raced. Overwhelmed by the implications of what I had uncovered, she had deceived me not only by concealing the truth about the stolen rings, but also by inventing a story about shoplifting. While there could be an alternative explanation, my mind couldn't come up with anything other than the unsettling thoughts swirling in my head. It became clear that I needed to uncover the significance of losing those rings, or else they would persistently occupy my thoughts and drive me to madness. One thing was increasingly evident. Those rings were inside her purse when she was dancing with an unknown man. Several weeks had elapsed since the incident, and she was about to embark on another trip in a few days. I realized I needed to gather more details about the schedule for her upcoming trip. I wanted to comprehend what she typically did in the evenings outside our home. If she was involved with other men, perhaps losing the rings had served as a wake-up call, prompting her to reassess her behavior. I knew that if I discovered her infidelity, it would likely spell the end of our marriage, though I dreaded considering how it might impact our children. She was undoubtedly a great mother, but I couldn't bear the thought of her having custody of the kids especially with her frequent business trips. My mind raced, desperately seeking any potential clues to shed light on her faithfulness. What other information might hint at her actions during her trips? Did she engage in unprotected encounters or insist on using contraceptives? I assumed she would opt for protection because she wouldn't want to risk bringing home infections or the possibility of an unwanted pregnancy. After all, I had a vasectomy after the birth of our second child rendering pregnancy impossible. She couldn't rely on the men she met having protection, so she must have had her own supply. One question remained. Where did she keep them? It was unlikely she stored them at our house or in the car, so the office seemed the most likely place. She probably carried them with her on business trips. I knew she transported her work papers, laptop, and presentation materials in a large briefcase she kept in her office. 
but if she had an early morning flight, she'd bring her bag home the night before, then pack it in a suitcase for the airport. This detail was crucial. I needed to find an opportunity to search the briefcase before her departure. I hoped her next trip involved an early morning flight. I made a deliberate choice to remain calm and composed, not displaying any signs that something was amiss. As it happened, when the kids returned from school, I was occupied with various tasks and had little time to dwell on my suspicions. Nonetheless, the specter of her infidelity continued to linger in the back of my mind. When Claire returned from work, I found myself in a bit of a mess. While preparing dinner, I accidentally spilled a dish of beans, creating a mess on the floor. The resulting chaos of cleaning up and managing the kids' activities left me looking somewhat disheveled. Fortunately, she didn't seem to notice any unusual behavior from me at that moment. After the commotion settled and everything was cleaned up, I greeted her with a kiss on the cheek. We sat down at the table as we normally did to enjoy dinner and engage in our typical chit-chat. Given our usual routine, I didn't expect her to have any growing suspicions about her upcoming trip. So, you're heading out on another trip in a couple of days? I asked. Yes, she replied, with little enthusiasm. It's the same old routine. I'm not looking forward to it. My curiosity prompted me to dig deeper. If you don't enjoy it, have you considered applying for a different role? You've been with the company for quite some time and have a good understanding of various aspects of its operations. I think you could adapt to almost any position. She mentioned her desire to gain more experience before transitioning to a desk job. However, I gently appealed to her conscience regarding the kids. And I really miss you when you're not home, I added, hoping to evoke a sense of guilt. I know, I'm sorry, she responded sympathetically. I miss all of you too. Seeking more details, I continued, so where exactly are you headed this time? Will you be leaving in the morning, giving us a chance to spend some time together before your departure? I held her gaze, mindful that our children could hear us. Despite trying to appear normal, my anxiety was evident as my stomach rumbled, making it difficult to eat. She seemed to think everything was fine as her reaction mirrored mine. I wondered if she had stomach issues, but it turned out she was eating without much enjoyment. Perhaps my suspicions were unfounded, but the urge to search her briefcase still lingered as it could potentially provide insight into her loyalty. I'm only going to Denton, so I'll be leaving tomorrow morning at 7.30, she mentioned. I need something to keep me going until I return on Friday, she added playfully, giving me a wink. I responded in a similar playful manner, trying to maintain a sense of normalcy. To my surprise, she blushed in response. Her comment about bringing her briefcase home the night before her trip suggested she wouldn't be stopping at the office before heading to the airport. Given her seemingly genuine attitude about the upcoming trip in front of our children and me, one might assume that either she hadn't been involved in any infidelity during her travels or she had become skilled at concealing such behavior. I hoped to uncover the truth when I examined the contents of her briefcase. On the evening before her planned trip, Claire returned home in high spirits. She parked her car next to mine in the garage as usual and appeared visibly excited. This left me wondering if her excitement was due to our conversation or if there was another reason behind it. Upon entering the house, she didn't bring her briefcase with her, assuming it was still in the car. I was busy preparing dinner, so we sat down at the table. She casually asked if I could retrieve her suitcase from the garage after we finished eating. Certainly, I replied, trying not to show any signs of suspicion. Are you all set for your trip? She asked, trying to reassure me. Oh yes, it's a routine trip. My briefcase is in the car, ready for the journey. I'll pack an overnight bag with the essentials. In an effort to maintain a sense of normalcy, I inquired, Do you have any plans while you're away? No, the kids and I will stick to our usual daily routine during the week. Maybe we can plan something family-friendly for the weekend, she replied, showing enthusiasm for the idea. Sounds like a plan, I responded, genuinely. After we finished dinner, she kindly helped me clear the table in the kitchen and loaded the dishwasher. Once we were done, she headed to the bedroom to pack her things, while I made my way to the garage to retrieve her suitcase. Upon inspecting the car, I didn't find the briefcase inside, leading me to believe it was securely placed in the trunk. Expecting this, I had already devised a plan to access it later in the evening. When I returned to the bedroom with her suitcase, I casually asked, Do you know where the car keys are? 
my tire seems to be slowly losing air. If I take it to the station, Jerry can fix it right away. For a brief moment, she appeared puzzled, but then reached for her purse, handing me the car keys. She proposed an alternative, saying, Couldn't you just use the spare tire? It's meant for emergencies? Taking a resolute stance, I responded, Yes, the spare tire is for emergencies, but we have enough time to properly fix this. I think that's the best course of action. I hurried back to the garage before she could change her mind. Swiftly, I drove her car out of the garage and headed to the junction station owned by my friend Jerry from school. Pulling up in front of one of the service bays, I honked my horn to get his attention. Jerry noticed me and opened the bay door, allowing me to drive in before closing it behind me. What's going on, buddy? Jerry asked. Curiously, I replied, My tire was supposed to be fixed here, but I needed a little time to check something else. Sensing that I might have some issues at home, he asked, Trouble at home, buddy? Maybe, I admitted, reluctantly opening the trunk and retrieving Claire's briefcase. Placing it on a nearby workbench, I unlocked it. Jerry, realizing a customer needed him, simply said, Well, I've got a customer, so take your time, my friend. Nodding to Jerry, he returned to the small shop attached to his station. I began to search the briefcase meticulously, ensuring that I didn't disturb anything. My hands explored the pockets on the lid unnecessarily, and to my shock, I discovered a package that drew my attention when I removed it. My heart sank as I realized it was an open package of contraceptives with about three pieces missing. My worst fears were confirmed. I carefully placed the package back where I found it and closed the briefcase once more. I stashed it in the trunk and secured it just as Jerry returned. Did you find what you were looking for? What's going on? He asked with evident curiosity. I'm afraid so, I replied, my voice tinged with a mix of disappointment and sadness. Mind if I stay here a bit longer? Perhaps you could check the tire pressure while I pretend to have resolved the issue. Jerry gave me a curious look, but complied without saying a word. He truly was a loyal friend. While he attended to the tire pressure, I drove out of the bay and pulled up at a gas station. I filled the tank with fuel, unsure of when I would do that for her again. My thoughts were filled with gratitude toward Jerry for his understanding as I made my way back home. As I pulled into the garage, a sense of darkness seemed to envelop my thoughts, and panic began to intensify. Fueled by anger and frustration, it was difficult to grasp how she could betray our marriage, our children, and me in such a manner. Amid the receding emotions, I shifted my focus to planning my next steps. To secure custody of our children, I needed concrete evidence of her infidelity and misconduct. Despite her shortcomings as a partner, I acknowledged her role as a good mother. The children deserved a maternal figure in their lives. While visitation rights would likely be granted, my ultimate goal was to gain full legal custody. She will have to explain the reasons behind our divorce to her brother and friends. As I entered the house, I called out from the bedroom saying, Everything's set. It was just a minor issue with a nail. Okay, thanks, she replied, still avoiding eye contact. Seeking solace, I went to the kitchen for a beer and then settled in the family room with the kids, who were absorbed in watching a TV show. About 30 minutes later, Claire joined us in the room and sat beside me on the couch. By then, my emotions had settled, but a deep sadness washed over me as I realized our once happy family was soon to be a thing of the past. To my surprise, Claire moved closer and snuggled up to me. Whispering in my ear, she asked, Are you ready for tonight? After taking a sip of beer, I replied, I think so, but I have a stomachache. Claire sympathetically responded, Oh, that's too bad, honey. Holding on to me, Claire softly said, I love you. And I instinctively put my arm around her shoulders, grappling with mixed feelings. Despite her betrayal, there was still a hint of affection from her. I couldn't help but wonder why she did it. Was it for excitement or a need for more connection than I could provide? I might never fully understand, but what was clear was the damage to my trust in her. We put the kids to bed together, and as she kissed our little angels goodnight, I couldn't help but look at her, knowing that by morning, she would be gone. Their young minds were already accustomed to her frequent travels, so their unease was minimal. That night, we made love, but it lacked the usual passion. Sensing my distress, Claire asked anxiously, Is your stomach still bothering you, dear? I nodded and replied, Yes, but I can handle it. 
desperately hoping she would choose our love and marriage over the upcoming trip, I asked. Do you really need to go on this trip? Deep down, I wished it were all just a nightmare that would vanish. She sighed and replied apologetically, I'm sorry, honey, but this trip is necessary. I'll do my best to wrap things up and return home as soon as I can. I'm really looking forward to the weekend with all of you. With a heavy heart, I sighed and said, Okay, honey, it's time to get some sleep. You have to get up early for your flight. I'll take a quick shower now so I won't have to worry about it in the morning. Okay, I replied. While she stepped into the shower, an impulse led me to inspect her suitcase to see what she had packed. Though the clothes on top seemed businesslike, I was surprised to find, upon closer examination, a selection of her most seductive lingerie and a small black cocktail dress in which she always looked irresistible. Respecting her personal space, I carefully returned everything to its place, closed the suitcase, and went back to bed. I couldn't sleep that night, and when I heard Claire stirring around five in the morning, I remained in bed, choosing not to bid her farewell. As was our custom, I felt a mix of weariness and sadness. Bending down to give me a kiss on the cheek before leaving, she inquired, Still not feeling well, honey? I simply nodded, struggling to express the turmoil within me. With the sound of the garage door closing, I finally got out of bed and made my way to the shower. I knew the day ahead would be filled with challenges. After seeing the kids off to school and having breakfast, I turned to the phone book to search for a private detective services in the yellow pages. My main criteria were to locate an agency with a nationwide presence, preferably in the city Claire was heading to. I reached out to several agencies and eventually found one with a branch in her destination area. I set up a meeting with them for the same morning, hoping they could provide the necessary information. Next on my agenda was finding a divorce attorney. A friend had recommended a specific lawyer, so I found his contact details and gave him a call. I arranged an appointment for the afternoon, hoping this lawyer could guide me through the challenging process we were about to face. When I arrived at the private investigator's office, I discussed my concerns and arranged for Claire to be surveilled on the evening she was away. I provided them with a photo of Claire and details of her travel route to aid in their identification. They assured me they would gather photos and compile a report on her activities as soon as her business day concluded. To ensure seamless communication, they agreed to send information via email to their Denton office and promised to provide a comprehensive report by Monday morning. Satisfied with their commitment, I made a substantial upfront payment. As a prepayment for their services, they informed me they might not be able to capture photographs, but they would strive to provide as many incriminating photos as possible. I agreed that it would suffice. My afternoon meeting with the lawyer proceeded as anticipated. He explained that in our state, divorce follows a no-fault principle, meaning there's no need to assign blame. However, given that I am the primary caregiver for our children, it's likely I will be granted custody. It was crucial for me to understand that Claire would receive substantial visitation rights for our children. Furthermore, our property would be divided equally with both sides getting an even split of 50%. Alimony wouldn't be necessary due to our similar incomes, but since I would have custody of the children, Claire would be obligated to pay alimony. As for the inheritance she obtained, it held no significance to me, and she needed to retain it for herself. My top priority was the well-being of our children. I instructed the lawyer to prepare the necessary documents to be delivered to Claire on Monday. Citing irreconcilable differences, I also asked her to agree to vacate our house immediately upon our divorce. The lawyer confirmed that, as the children's guardian, I had the authority to make this request. It was decided that once the children reached 18, we would sell the house, and the proceeds would be divided between us. Leaving the lawyer's office, I felt a sense of contentment, realizing that life would move forward for me and the children while Claire would have to face the consequences of her betrayal. At that moment, I didn't take immediate action concerning our finances, insurance, or other legal matters. I assumed I'd have sufficient time to address these issues after serving her with divorce papers. Given her inheritance, I believed she wouldn't have to be concerned about her share of our joint savings. When it was time for school to conclude, I headed home to catch the bus. On Friday afternoon when Claire returned, I kindly offered to take care of her laundry, but she politely declined insisting she would handle it later. 
I couldn't help but grin, recognizing how playfully mischievous I had been. Deep down, I fully comprehended why she preferred to manage the laundry herself. It was crucial for her to keep her extramarital affairs concealed at all costs. Later, as we lay in bed, Claire expressed worry about my ongoing stomach issues and suggested I see a doctor. This has been persisting for too long, she emphasized. I playfully responded to Claire, letting her know that I intended to try a new medication, recommended by a friend, to address my persistent stomach problems. I expressed optimism that this would resolve the issue and bring her back to me soon. When we embraced, she whispered that she missed me greatly. On Monday, as the kids left for school and Claire headed to work, I received a call from the detective agency, informing me that they had a report ready. I told them I'd be there shortly, and within 30 minutes, I was sitting down with the office manager, discussing the details. The office manager informed me that a report with attached photos had been faxed from Denton that morning. He admitted he hadn't had time to read the entire report, but upon a quick scan and a glance at the photos, it seemed highly incriminating. I took a copy of the report and started reading its contents. The subject of the report was identified as Claire Barton. According to the report records, the surveillance of the woman began at 5.17 p.m. on Wednesday, June 16th, in the lobby of the Denton Marriott Hotel. Her identity was confirmed by comparing a photo obtained from the Merrickville office. Upon closer examination of the report, it turned out that she was wearing a company badge, further confirming her identity. Moreover, the report detailed the movements of the subject and noted she was carrying a briefcase. When she entered the elevator, a staff member accompanied her and verified her arrival at room 414 at 5.23 p.m. It's important to note that the report emphasized that the subject was alone at that time. Additionally, the report included a photograph labeled Exhibit 1A, showing the subject dressed professionally before entering the room. When looking at the photo, it was clear she still wore rings. Evidently, the photo was taken discreetly using a mobile phone. The report stated that the agents had rented a room across from the subject's room. At 6.31 p.m., they received a signal that the subject had left her room and was heading for the elevator. A minute later, at 6.32 p.m., the subject exited the elevator and entered the lobby. The report noted she was dressed as described in Example 1B. Upon examining Example 1B, it became evident that Claire was wearing a small black cocktail dress paired with high-heeled shoes. She was also adorned with a necklace I had given her for our 10th anniversary celebration. However, what stood out the most was the absence of wedding rings on her left hand. The photo showed clearly that she wasn't wearing them. The report mentioned that the staff had rented a room across from hers. A minute later, at 6.32 p.m., the subject exited the elevator and entered the lobby. The report noted she was dressed as described in Example 1B. Upon examining Example 1B, it was clear that Claire was wearing a small black cocktail dress paired with high-heeled shoes. She was also adorned with a necklace I had given her for our 10th anniversary celebration. However, what stood out the most was the absence of wedding rings on her left hand. The photo clearly showed she wasn't wearing them. The photo identified as Exhibit 1D displays Claire and a man in a tight embrace, engaged in a passionate kiss while seated in a booth. The intensity of their connection was clearly visible in the picture. At 8.51 p.m., the report noted that both individuals left the restaurant. They then took the elevator and ascended to Claire's floor. Another photo, labeled Exhibit 1E, captures the moment when Claire and the man entered her room, specifically room 414. In this image, Claire appears slightly intoxicated but undeniably pleased with the evening's events. At 11.13 p.m., the man exited Claire's room and left the building. The report included the license plate number of a car registered to Alexander B. Tate, residing at 1424 Azalea Drive in Denton. Notably, Alexander B. Tate was married and had two young children. As I delved further into the report's details, it became evident that Claire repeated her actions the following night with another man. The report bore the signature of an investigator from Denton. This revelation filled me with deep anxiety and resentment. It became clear that my wife was leading a promiscuous life while she was away from home. I couldn't come to terms with her actions, 
it was a betrayal that exceeded my worst expectations. Even the fact that Claire had lost her wedding rings didn't stop her from being careless. After settling the bill with the private detective, I thanked them and left. I made sure to take two additional copies of the report, which were recorded on a CD, to keep them safe. Once I got back home, I wasted no time and immediately called my divorce attorney. I asked about the status of the divorce papers, and the attorney confirmed they were ready for filing. Without hesitation, I instructed them to initiate the filing process and specifically requested that the papers be served to her publicly at her workplace the following day. The attorney assured me that this could be done smoothly and asked for her workplace address, which I promptly provided. My intentions were clear. I aimed to humiliate her during the legal proceedings. Handing her the divorce papers at her workplace not only satisfied my desire for revenge, but also served as a form of justice for her actions. That night, there was no love between us. Claire seemed to sense that something was wrong, perhaps suspecting that I had discovered something unsettling. Though she didn't directly voice her concerns, she expressed hope for my quick recovery. Interestingly, she also appeared somewhat reserved, but I chose not to comment on it and simply ignored it. The next morning, I woke up early after a night of little sleep. I immersed myself in work on the computer until I heard the children waking up, and then I went to the kitchen to prepare breakfast. After the meal, I said goodbye to Claire. When she left for work, she approached me for a hug and a kiss, but I responded with a half-playful embrace, encouraging her to leave quickly. At that moment, I sensed she might have had an inkling of what awaited her. As I closed the door behind her, tears welled up in her eyes, and she whispered, I love you. After her departure, profound sadness washed over me, and I felt an urge to release my tears. Yet, I quickly composed myself as the children required my attention, and I needed to prepare them for the school bus. Around 10.45 a.m., the phone rang, disrupting our morning routine, displaying Claire's workplace on the caller ID. I answered the call without uttering a word, and there was a brief pause as the caller realized I wasn't inclined to engage in conversation. In a trembling voice and a whisper, Claire said, I'm sorry. Shortly after, the line fell silent, and I remained silent as well. Claire didn't return home that night, and I wondered if she continued her deceitful game, seemingly indifferent to her husband. While I recognized my anger was justified, I also considered that I might have been overly harsh on her. The children, disheartened by their mother's absence, wondered where she was. To uplift their spirits, I invited them to have dinner at a McDonald's cafe. By the time we returned home after dinner, the kids were exhausted and went straight to bed. The next morning, Claire called with a request. Honey, can I come home and pack my things? Can we talk? Initially, a sense of guilt welled up within me, but it quickly dissipated. I replied calmly, Why don't you come between nine and noon? As I continued, Then the kids and I won't be here. Regarding our conversation, I made it clear that I'd speak with her one-on-one -on -one in my lawyer's office only after she signed, notarized, and returned the divorce documents. Then I'll listen to whatever you have to say. There was a sob on the line before Claire answered, Good. Shortly after the phone fell silent again, she signed the divorce papers, and six months later, our marriage officially came to an end. It turned out that she became pregnant during the affair. Unfortunately, when she attempted to conceal it from her last lover, contraception failed, considering it was near the childbearing age. Even if I hadn't found out about her infidelity through the lost rings, the truth would probably have come out eventually. There were rumors that she had started dating again. If she ever gets close to getting married again, I've thought about honestly warning her future spouse about her unfaithfulness. It seems unnecessary for her to deceive and hurt another person. We had a meeting, and during our conversation in my lawyer's office, I shared my thoughts with her. She pleaded with me to reconsider the divorce decision. She talked about how difficult it was for her not to have unrestricted access to our children. However, I explained that I couldn't trust her anymore. Then she mentioned that she had seen a psychologist who diagnosed her with nymphomania. She assured me that her impulses were now under control. Despite her explanations, I told her that it wasn't enough for me. Even if she claimed to have her urges in check, the fact that she hadn't sought help earlier 
indicated a lack of proactive effort on her part. If she had addressed her cravings from the beginning, she might not have found herself in the current situation. When I left the lawyer's office, she continued to cry. Having recently reconnected with a school friend who keeps me updated, I learned that he works at a nightclub. He mentioned seeing my ex-wife at the club where he works on several weekend nights. She frequents the club with different men and behaves provocatively. I was deeply hurt that my children have such an irresponsible mother. Perhaps my ex-wife never recovered from nymphomania. A friend of Claire's also called me and informed me that Claire was in poor health. She said my ex-wife needed my assistance because she had contracted herpes. Meanwhile, she continued her promiscuous lifestyle. I sympathized with her but conveyed that I couldn't offer any help, nor did I want to. Claire chose this lifestyle and its associated health issues. I began dating again, and it seems I've found someone special. This woman, around my age and divorced herself, discovered her ex-husband's infidelity and didn't tolerate such behavior. She possesses strength and resilience, qualities I genuinely admire. It seems that my children also like her. I believe this is a natural progression, and it's only a matter of time before I consider taking our relationship to a new level.